Uh, the title of the program is Understanding Unexplained Illness from Knowledge to Action. Severe fatigue and other serious symptoms, sometimes called chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS, was once regarded as the yuppie flu and uh, trivialized by healthcare professionals. Uh, it's now recognized as a debilitating illness afflicting more than uh, a million Americans with 90% of them undiagnosed. Uh, there's a cost to the society of over $20 billion a year for this illness. Functional limitations are worse for those with this illness uh, than for those with chronic heart disease. Although experts now agree that the disease has a physical basis, there is a long-running and sometimes contentious debate about who has the condition and what may be causing it. Today we will learn from a leading community researcher about why diagnosis is so complicated, how applied research can inform public policy to improve services, and about his commitment to reduce stigma, empower citizens, and reduce barriers to full participation in community life. Leonard Jason is currently a professor of psychology at DePaul University and the director of the Center for Community Research. He is a former president of the Division of Community Psychology of the American Psychological Association and has served as the vice president of the intergenerational, pardon me, international uh, American Association of CFS slash ME. Um, he has also served as the chairperson of the Research Subcommittee of the U.S. Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. Uh, he has edited or written 27 books, and he has published over 725 articles, and has served on the editorial boards of 10 psychological journals. In 2013, he was presented with DePaul University's College of Science and Health's Excellence in Research Award. In 2015, he was presented the American Psychological Association's Award for Distinguished Professional Contributions to Applied Research. There's much more to his impressive biology, but I need to allow some time for him to talk. Uh, please welcome Leonard Jason. Thank you for that warm introduction. This is the first time I've been to this building and this society, so I appreciate the invitation, and uh, it's really a beautiful place. Um, unexplained illnesses are something that are a significant problem to our healthcare system as well as to the patients that have them. If you think about it, in primary care, something like 30% of individuals coming to a physician or healthcare worker Generally, there is not a good explanation for their pain or fatigue, which is actually the things that often bring people into their medical physician. If you look at physicians and you have them list a set of symptoms, usually the things that are least important from their perspective are pain and fatigue. If you basically talk to patients and you have them list the priorities of what's most important, pain and fatigue are at the top of the list. So there's really a very strong disconnect between patients and their experience and their need for help and also what happens with the healthcare system that treats them. I'm gonna be speaking today of a very specific type of unexplained type symptom, um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, we're trying to change the name to myalgic encephalitis. Actually, that was the term that was used for this illness before the Centers for Disease Control in 1988, renamed it with chronic fatigue syndrome. And we'll try to talk a little bit about the implications of that name change a little bit later. So first thing, when I talk about ME or CFS, um, I think it's important to recognize, just as um, was mentioned, that it is a very functionally impaired illness, um, as functionally impaired or more so than things like MS, congestive heart disease, um, diabetes or end-stage renal disease, as a number of studies have found. The topic of our conversation today is chronic fatigue syndrome, or myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, and as I was saying, it is a very significant illness, 
certainly compared to other types of chronic illnesses. Even though it has functional limitations that are significant and debilitating, many individuals with this illness actually experience tremendous amounts of stigma. For example, 95% of individuals seeking medical treatment for this symptom and set of symptoms report feelings of estrangement from the healthcare system. 85% of clinicians view ME and CFS as wholly or partially psychiatric. Hundreds of thousands of patients cannot find a knowledgeable and sympathetic physician to take care of them. I get regularly phone calls from people in this geographic area who are looking for medical people to help them. And again, there's a real dearth of trained individuals around the country, which is a significant problem. I think some of the disconnect between the significant problem that we have and the fact that there's so much stigma associated with this illness, as are other types of illnesses that are unexplained, um, are due to a number of factors. And I'm going to be talking about each of these factors and trying to indicate the myths that were developed because of those factors and how these myths have to be changed. So the first myth is that really occurred in the 1980s and early 90s is that this is a rare disorder. In a sense, this was a myth that started with the Centers for Disease Control doing a prevalence study, they call it epidemiological studies, where they basically took four catchment cities around the United States and they had physicians nominate patients that were then evaluated. The problem with that type study was that if physicians didn't believe patients had this illness, because there's still a lot of disbelief about this illness, they wouldn't nominate patients. And a lot of patients basically don't have health care insurance, so they're not in the health care system. They've, exp they've expended their fu funding and their finances, um, so they weren't being counted. So we thought there was a significant problem. That particular study done in the 1980s and early 1990s and actually published um, in the late 1990s um, indicated that there were less than 20,000 people in the United States with this illness. Well, if you have an illness that's very low prevalence, you're not going to get a lot of public attention or resources for that particular illness. So when I began work in this area, I thought that epidemiology and getting the numbers right was important. And one of the reasons that we thought that 20,000 was a little bit low was that the self-help organization, which was the CFIDS Association, had about that number of patients in it. So we didn't think that they had all the patients in the world, um, or at least in the United States. The other thing that was happening was the CDC was getting about 4,000 phone calls every month about unexplained fatigue. So we, again, these were indicators that this number was probably incorrect in an underestimate. So we spent several years actually um, trying to get a funding for a grant and eventually got a grant from the National Institutes of Health where we wanted to get a random community sample of about 28,000 people. Um, and those who reported fatigue and other symptoms were brought in to um, a hospital where we had a complete medical and psychiatric evaluation of them. So as was reported, um, we found that 90% of the individuals that we actually ended up diagnosing with this illness had never been diagnosed before. Um, and the estimates of less than 20,000, which the CDC had indicated, was really very um, incorrect. Um, the true estimates were probably closer to a million people. Um, this study was done in 1999. Um, it took us actually 10 years to do this particular study, from trying to get the funding to actually getting the funding and actually disseminating the research. Some of the interesting findings were that um, often we think about this illness as a yuppie flu disease of primarily white middle class women. Um, and yet we found that Latinos and African Americans actually had higher rates than Caucasians. As you can see in this particular graph, Latinos had the highest rates. In addition, if you look at a variety of other diseases like women with HIV, women with lung cancer, women with breast cancer, um, the actual prevalence rates for people who have um, ME and CFS are 522, which are higher than those other rates um, for these other illnesses. So again, we're talking about an illness 
that affects quite a few women as well as men. These results were disseminated, um, for example, in the New York Times, um, chronic fatigue no longer seen as yuppie flu in this particular um, newspaper article. And in Chicago, the Chicago Defender, African Americans suffer from CFS at higher rate, commonly overlooked than in whites. So the first myth was that this is a very rare disorder, um, doesn't happen with many people, and again, that was a myth. Um, and certainly today, um, people recognize that over a million people have this illness, and that has created at least more interest in this particular interest in this particular illness from um, not only on the scientific community, um, but also um, the National Institutes of Health. The second myth about this illness is that the case definition is accurate. And again, a case definition is critical for any illness. You can't really do research unless you have case definition that has what's called good specificity and sensitivity. So a case definition is like a house of cards. The bottom level has to be secure because if that case definition doesn't reliably identify cases, everything else that's built on that house of cards, for example, etiology, pathophysiology, prevalence rates, as well as biological markers and treatment are very shaky and likely not to be reliable. Unfortunately, the case definition for chronic fatigue syndrome was arrived at by a group of people at the CDC sitting around a table um, and making a decision. Um, I think the decision was not a good one that was made um, initially in 1988 and later revised in 1994. So let's look at that criteria that has been used around the world since 1994. Patients are required to experience chronic fatigue of new or definite onset, six months or more, not substantially alleviated by rest of fatigue. The fatigue is not the result of ongoing exertion, and the fatigue produces significant reductions in occupational, social, or personal activities. In addition, there need to be at least four out of these eight symptoms that are up on the screen. Unfortunately, and this is, again, one of many problems with this case definition, these symptoms in red, which are unrefreshing sleep, post-exertional malaise, more than 24 hours, persistent or recurring impairment in short-term memory or concentration, these are critical symptoms for chronic fatigue syndrome. And yet, a person could be diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome by having four of the symptoms in white that are not core, fundamental symptoms of this illness. They occur in some patients, but not all. So think about it. Having an illness where the core symptoms don't have to occur and you can actually bring patients into that category, a major methodological problem for researchers. I'll give you an example. A person with major depressive disorder could be diagnosed with ME or CFS because depression often involves chronic fatigue and four minor symptoms, such as unrefreshing sleep, joint pain, muscle pain, or impairment in concentration. Now, I'm not saying that a person with a, a medical problem like chronic fatigue syndrome might not have comorbid psychiatric comorbidity like a major depressive disorder. But what I'm saying is that if one has solely a major depressive disorder and not chronic fatigue syndrome, then one needs to differentiate it from chronic fatigue syndrome. And the reason that's important is because major depressive disorder is one of the most prevalent illnesses, one of the most prevalent chronic psychiatric illnesses affecting something like 2.3 to 2.4 percent of the population. It's a lot of people. Now, if you do it right and you use the right types of um, measures, um, and Caroline King, who's a doctoral dissertation at DePaul, one of my students, we actually got a group of people with major depressive disorder and a group with chronic fatigue syndrome, and we were able to make 100 percent differentiation between the groups for a couple of things. For example, individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome don't have self-reproach, don't have these ne negative types of feelings about themselves. So that's one thing that um, differentiates them. People with um, chronic fatigue syndrome also um, generally feel worse when they exercise. It's called post-exertional malaise. They, they push themselves a little bit and they feel like all their symptoms get exacerbated. People with major depressive disorder, when they actually get more active, they feel better. So again, 
very distinctions that can occur if you ask the right questions. However, if you don't do it sensitively, you can bring those people with major depressive disorder into the category of chronic fatigue syndrome. And if you do that, it's very difficult to find biological markers. And then if you don't find biological markers, you assume that the illness is psychiatric, which is what has happened. We're currently working with the College of Computing and Digital Media. Um, Jacob First is one of our colleagues there. Um, using something called machine learning or data mining, some people call it artificial intelligence, where we put in a bunch of symptoms and we have different groups, um, for example, controls, healthy controls versus people with ME and CFS or people with multiple sclerosis and people with ME and CFS and we're actually putting different disorders in to see if we can find symptoms that differentiate the groups. But the computers basically come up with the symptoms so that it's, it's actually the system learns to kind of make differentiations between the different groups. And using these types of techniques, we're able to identify something like 95% of individuals in the two groups accurately. So again, that's some of the current work that we're doing. This research suggests that an empirical case definition probably should include those cardinal symptoms that I talked about earlier. One being post-exertional malaise, another unrefreshing sleep, and another one cognitive problems. So in a sense, memory, concentration, those are the key issues. And other things like pain and autonomic manifestations like lightheadedness or neuroendocrine manifestations like recurrent feelings of feverishness or immune manifestations like recurrent sore throats, they might be secondary, not primary in this illness. Okay, so we talked about one myth that this illness is rare. It's a myth. Illness is not rare. It's one of the more cr common chronic conditions that affect um, not only people in this country, but other countries too. The other myth is the case definition is inaccurate. Case definition that was put together in 94 is not accurate and has lots of reliability problems. And there have been efforts made to develop better case definitions that require these types of very specific symptoms. Um, the third myth is that the symptoms are measured appropriately. And I'm going to show you how it's very possible to measure symptoms inappropriately and make the wrong conclusions about patients that becomes further stigmatizing for patients. So let's first talk about psychiatric comorbidity. There's two types of tests that are both structured clinical interviews. One's called the SCID, S-C-I-D, Structured Clinical Interview, and you have to have a master's degree and some clinical training to give that. And the other one is DIS, the Diagnostic Interview Schedule, which can be given by a layperson without that types of training. Now, it's very interesting. We got a bunch of people together um, who had this illness, and we gave them both tests, counterbalance, so we could find out, does the rates change? And isn't that interesting? With one test, we get 22% having a psychiatric disorder. With the other, 50%. Well, it's very interesting that the DIS has been used primarily with patients in this illness. But the DIS was never made to be used with individuals with chronic illnesses. It's used to be used with people with psychiatric illnesses. So if you use the wrong instrument, you end up with high rates of psychiatric comorbidity and then what you ended up doing is concluding it's a psychiatric disorder. That's a problem with measurement. I'll give you another example. This is tall actigraphy, and an actigraph is very similar to kind of a pedometer. And as you all know, everyone has pedometers, and a lot of people have wristwatches with kind of are able to, um, to sort of indicate their activity. This is just a more um, sensitive way of doing this. This particular diagram up here is a healthy individual. You can see diurnal patterns, day one, day two, and this is activity. So what happens with, yeah, got, got it back. So, so what happens with the person is that they sleep at night, they're, they're, they're resting, during the day they have spiking activity. This is very common for what we see in individuals who are healthy. This is a patient with chronic fatigue syndrome. So what you see is lots of activity, but there's no spiking, and there's no basically resting at night because sleep is basically interrupted. 
However, these types of data were misinterpreted because they didn't look at diurnal patterns. So what happened was, ultimately, they concluded that the same amount of activity occurs in these two people. So they said, basically, there's really an imagined perceptual problem of activity reductions. But the patterns are different. And if you looked at it appropriately with diurnal patterns, you can see prominent differences between these two people. So when you collect data, you have to do it appropriately, which hasn't been done, unfortunately, too often with this illness. Here's another example, depression. Patients reporting fatigue for six months or more. MDD, this group over here, is called major depressive disorder. So on this particular graph, you can see that the MECFS group and the MDD group have the same levels of reporting six months of fatigue, okay? So, so they both have fatigue. So if you just have a measure, have you had fatigue for six months, you see no differences, whereas the control group has very little fatigue. So it's very easy to conclude by this that basically, well, it must be the same thing. However, if you look at the severity of the fatigue, and that's what this graph's about, this figure, you can see that the MDD group has much less severe fatigue. So you've got to ask the question appropriately. It's not just fatigue of six months, it's severity of the fatigue that differentiates the groups. Again, a measurement issue that's critical for differentiating depression from chronic fatigue syndrome. Give you another example. This is a healthy person who has these chronic symptoms that we talked about, the Fukuda 1994 criteria, which we mentioned earlier. Things like unrefreshing sleep, concentration problems, sore throat. What's interesting is, if you basically just talk about the occurrence of symptoms, this healthy person would actually be classified as having chronic fatigue syndrome. Why? Because these symptoms are common in the population. However, if you look at intensity from zero to 100, with 100 being more intense, you can see that this person has very low levels of symptoms, about four symptoms. So there's four of them. And I, I would imagine if I would ask you out there, do you have some of these symptoms, probably a number of you would say, yeah. You know, I kind of last night, I was out late at night, I didn't sleep that well. So I had some unrefreshing sleep. Okay, a lot of them are understandable. Headaches, again, very common. However, now take a look at, by the way, the orange is today and the yellow is worst period. So this is a healthy person. If you just measure symptoms based on occurrence, you absolutely miss the phenomena of chronic fatigue syndrome. And the case definition looked at occurrence. Now let's look at a patient. You see the difference? You've got to look at the severity, the intensity, not just the occurrence. That's why it's important from a measurement point to get it right so that you don't bring healthy individuals into your sample who are inappropriately put in your sample. Now, we're doing work with um, Matthew Sorensen, who's an immunologist at DePaul University, and this is basically a patient. And these are called cytokines, which communicate with each other in the immune system. Won't go into too much details, but you can see this is a pattern of patients who have this illness. Take a look at this. This is a healthy individual. Um, and you can see the difference patterning of cytokines. So if you do it right, you can really differentiate not only healthy individuals, from chronic fatigue syndrome, but also people with multiple sclerosis. We have a manuscript on this that we just submitted for publication. But most physicians don't have these types of sensitive tests. They can't basically do this type of work so that they come into a physician, their blood stuff comes out okay, and they conclude that this person must be psychiatrically impaired or making it up or malingering. So they basically get further stigma. That's because the types of sophisticated testing that are needed to really differentiate these patients from others is often not available. Okay, so we've talked about the rare disorder being a myth, case definition, inappropriate still, symptoms often being measured inappropriately, 
Now let's talk about the term chronic fatigue syndrome. Is that a non-stigmatizing term? I think it's a very stigmatizing term. If I were to basically say that you have a chronic cough syndrome, you'd say, so what? Everyone coughs. But if you said it was emphysema or bronchitis, you'd probably say, oh, this is significant. So what you call something makes a big difference. So in the 1950s and 1980s, um, in Great Britain primarily, um, this term, what, myalgic encephalomyelitis, was used. And then it got hijacked in 1988, the Centers for Disease Control renamed it chronic fatigue syndrome. And the patients were very dissatisfied because they felt it trivialized their illness. When they go to their friends, when they go to their family members, when they go to health care professionals, people don't take chronic fatigue syndrome seriously, in part because of the name. So we wanted to test this out. Um, is it really true that the name is stigmatizing? So we gave medical trainees a similar case description of a person with typical symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome or ME. And then after we gave a case scenario, we said that the person had chronic fatigue syndrome or ME. Um, and then we had a, sit, a list of attributions that we could find out. Did the name with the same case study change people's attributions for medical trainees? And basically, we did find that the attributions about the nature of the person's illness did change. So, for example, the likelihood of improvement within the next two years, if it was called ME, it was much less likely improvement within the next two years than if it was called CFS, based on this graph that we have there. We also replicated these studies with undergraduates at DePaul, and again, if you call it ME, it's significantly more likely to have an attribution that it's a medical rather than a psychiatric illness. So you can see the name makes a difference. And it's very interesting, this study was suggested to us, they said, you folks do this study, so we have some ammunition that we can use to basically try to get the name changed. And a patient suggested this. So it's very collaborative research that we're talking about. The patients, for lots of the research we've been doing on this illness for the last 25 years, have come to us with the suggestions of saying, please, look at this issue, get us some data so we can use it in advocacy purposes. So the Department of Health and Human Services um, developed something called the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Coordinating Committee um, in 2000. Because of the work I had done on epidemiology prevalence as well as the name change, I was appointed to this committee. Um, and basically, within the committee, we opened up a name change work group in 2000, and we came up with some new names in 2003, um, which were not accepted at that time. This was an example with the CFS Advisory Committee, which took the place of the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Coordinating Committee. And what's important about this is this particular committee makes recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services about chronic fatigue syndrome. So there are really policy implications here. And just to let you know, over the past 10 years, the advisory committee voted to change the name to MECFS. And I was actually the person to make the motion um, to make that change on the committee. Um, and the reason we said MECFS was we said this would be a transition term so that people could slowly get used to saying MECFS and eventually move to ME. And the International Association of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, which is a scientific organization, also changed their name to IACFS-ME, and I was the person who made that suggestion on the board when that occurred. And also, um, the editor of ProHealth brought seven researchers together, including myself, in 2007, and we all endorsed the term MECFS at the time. Unfortunately, the Institute of Medicine in 2015 recommended a new name, which is called Systemic Exercise Intolerance Disease, SEID. Um, and I had a number of people came to me and said, this is terrible. You know, first thing, they can't pronounce it, systemic exercise intolerance disease, try to remember it um, if you have cognitive problems. And SEID, um, so the patients basically said, what can we do about this name? And what I basically said is do a poll. 
So I helped one patient advocate, um, Lisa Petrosen, put a poll out, and the vast majority of patients indicated they hated this name. Um, and that poll was given to the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, and there's been no movement, fortunately, on changing the name to SCID, at least at this point. So we've talked about this illness being a rare disorder. It's not rare. That contributed to some of the myth. We talked about case definition being accurate. It's not a good case definition. There's been efforts made to change. I can talk about that if you're interested. Um, symptoms are measured appropriately. That's also contributed to the stigma of this illness. The term chronic fatigue syndrome is non-stigmatizing. It is stigmatizing. Chronic fatigue syndrome needs to change. Um, we all know that, um, and the process is beginning. Um, and many people, many patient organizations are now calling themselves ME <coughs> rather than CFS. Um, the last stigma that I'm going to talk about is psychiatric or psychological treatment, CBT meaning cognitive behavior therapy. Now remember, I'm a psychologist, and I do cognitive behavior therapy treatment. Um, and cognitive behavior therapy treatment has been useful for many different types of disorders, from cancer to heart disease, on and on. It's a very effective, particularly for depression, I might add. However, it's a very unusual type of cognitive behavior therapy that they're using for patients with CFS that developed in Great Britain. Patients with ME and CFS were basically told that they have inaccurately attributed their symptoms to physical causes, that they're overly preoccupied by physical limitations, that they do not maintain regular activity, and they maintain a self-defeating preoccupation with symptoms. Can you imagine if you were told this and you felt you had cancer, you would basically be outraged and you would say, this has to change. Well, this is what's been going on in the battle between healthcare providers and patients. In a very influential article in Lancet um, in 2011 came out that basically said, that CBT not only improved, but cured many patients. Now, it's very interesting that there's been a tremendous patient reaction against this Lancet article, um, and, um, and, and I've actually had some involvement, and um, we're in the process of writing up um, a, um, an article for the New York Times that um, we'll be talking more about um, our opposition to what they have come out with. Um, this was an article, if you can believe it, where they had criteria for coming into the study that was at a particular mark that then they changed in the middle of the study. They had criteria for outcomes that they changed in the middle of the study, such that you could come into the study with a certain particular score on some, some measures and basically be considered cured based on your baseline findings. It, it's really an amazing story as to kind of what happened in this study. In any event, in 2003, another of my doctoral student, Sharon Song, evaluated this model of CBT. And what we found very interesting, with patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, it didn't work. It wasn't tested out. But if you had fatigue that was psychiatrically mediated, it did work. Very interesting. So what are patients' reaction to cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise? Graded exercise means you basically do more and more each day. Regardless if you have any symptoms, the symptom flare-ups, you keep just pushing yourself a little bit more. Um, well, um, most patients found this particular treatment in polls to be not effective. As a matter of fact, many people have said that once they got themselves pushed beyond their energy, um, availability, um, they actually often had relapses, and many have never gotten back to their premorbid condition. Um, our group at the Paul in um, 1995 took a different track. We basically developed what's called the envelope theory. By the way, the term for this came from a patient in the Chicago area. Um, and what we said was symptoms worsen when the body and brain are pressured to function beyond their current capacity. Um, the objective is to stay within the energy boundaries. Over time, patients will restore energy, lessen pain, other symptoms, and lessen illness severity. 
So think about yourself. Say your battery, your available energy is 100. That's a healthy battery, okay? The MECFS battery, that available energy might be 10 or 20, okay? So they have just much less to do, but they've got lots of things that they might have to get groceries, do some cleaning, um, take care of childcare responsibilities, maybe even part-time work. They don't have the energy to do all those things. So making them push beyond their available energy is very counterproductive. So what we basically say is, what is your perceived energy, what's your available energy, and how much do you expend? And how do you keep that within a balance? That's what the energy envelope, it's called pacing. If you're expending more energy than you have available or perceived, you're gonna drain that battery. And that's what we basically say that's being overextended. That's the typical situation of many patients. So rather than to get them to be more ex overextended, we basically want them to do less, not more. So at baseline, we found that many patients are expending much more energy than is available. But again, by treatment, we see kind of this staying within the energy envelope. And that's the work that we do. One example, um, we don't challenge patients' belief in a medical cause, and we recommend that patients pace according to available energy, staying with the energy envelope. In one study that we did, we had a buddy give patients one hour a week um, and also a mentor available to talk to the person. Patients who got this program for four months, um, some patients got it, some patients didn't. Um, we helped them stay within their energy envelope. We saw significant reductions in fatigue severity for those who reported getting this intervention that helped them stay within their energy envelope. Okay, so I am about at my time, so I am going to wrap things up. But just in conclusion, um, what we have suggested is that there were a number of myths that have been out there that have contributed to the stigma that continues to exist with patients with this unexplained illness. But there are many other types of unexplained illnesses. And I might, I might say that when you have an illness, that's unexplained, that doesn't have biological markers, then you have problems because it's very easy for people to dismiss those symptoms. It happened with MS. MS up till the 1960s was really considered to be a psychiatric disorder. It is happening with this particular illness. It probably happens with other illnesses too. And what we've suggested in this talk is that flawed epidemiology, a non-empirical case definition, inappropriate measurement of symptoms, a trivial name given to the illness by the Centers for Disease Control, and victim victimization, treatment, victimita vic treatment victimization by this cognitive behavior therapy model that's been applied to patients with ME and CFS has furthered um, the type of stigma that occurs with patients. Thank you. You did not mention fibromyalgia. Have you anything to say about it? Sure. Um, fibro, um, for, for those folks who don't know, think, think of a triangle. If you have primarily fatigue, those types of symptoms, you have chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, if it's primarily pain that you feel it's fibromyalgia, and if you're exposed to chemicals, um, and you basically feel sick when you're exposed to perfumes and petroleum products, then it's called multiple chemical sensitivities. So these are kind of like basically three different illnesses that each overlap in some ways. Some individuals have all three, and we've actually found that if you have all three or two of the three, um, your impairment is significantly worse. Um, fibromyalgia is a little bit different in that there are several um, FDA approved drugs for it where there isn't for um, ME and CFS. Um, fibromyalgia also is a little different in that um, it seems that there have been some exercise programs that have been effective with patients with fibromyalgia. Um, those exercise programs, as I've suggested, um, have generally not been effective with people with uh, ME and CFS. Um, there's probably a little bit less stigma 
for fibromyalgia, but still it's considerable. Um, I think Lyrica and all the advertisements that has occurred with that has probably helped um, in a sense, um, you know, people feel, oh, this must be a legitimate illness. First thing, it's fibromyalgia. It sounds a little bit more complicated. Um, it sounds more medical, and there are drugs that are prescribed for it. Um, generally, people who go to um, the rheumatologist will get diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Um, people who go to the internist will more likely get chronic fatigue syndrome. There's been a number of uh, individuals who think that they're similar, um, that there's a lot of overlap. I tend to think of them as different, um, but certainly um, the person with fibromyalgia um, you know, has um, lots of chronic pain in different parts of their body. Um, and, and it doesn't say that the person with um, ME and CFS doesn't have pain, but pain is their primary issue with fibromyalgia. Um, these types of fatigue and other types of energy, lack of stamina, uh, endurance, are the primary issues with uh, the patient with um, um, ME and CFS. Hi, I'm over here by the stairs. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm sort of a 30-year veteran of the health policy wars. Uh, I work on, at the national level um, on physician payment policy. And one of the things that just breaks my heart day in and day out and is our inability um, to figure out how to effectively engage stakeholders in a respectful way that listens but also acknowledges um, the different uh, competencies and expertise. So when I, in the case of Medicare payment policy, doctors, uh, the assumption is doctors know more than economists and public policy people about stuff that really isn't medical, and yet I understand it needs to make sense to them and we need to hear from them the realities of practicing medicine. I think in your, the things you're talking about, I'd love to hear from you examples of successful engagement of a patient advocacy, provider advocacy, payers, and policymakers who can listen to each other, learn from each other, and respect each other's expertise to come up with an answer that helps move everybody forward. So, um, you know, I, I am what's called a clinical community psychologist, so my, my basic interest, although it's focusing on, on these types of health issues, um, whether it's um, addiction um, or fatigue or violence, um, my, my basic interest is in policy. Um, and um, how do we affect policy changes? Um, so in this particular area, um, and I actually worked on tobacco settlement issues, and that was um, comparable, and I actually testified in Congress on the tobacco settlement a number of years ago. Um, you know, we had this Goliath sort of the tobacco industry, and, and for decades, you know, they were just, I mean, smokers were everywhere, and, you know, non-smokers' rights were minimal. And there's been a sea change that has occurred in tobacco. So I'm, I'm sort of um, optimistic that these things can occur, um, but it's not going to occur quickly. It takes time. Um, now, in the very specific area of my lecture, um, I mean, CFS, um, we had a very difficult situation um, that I lived through um, from the 1980s to today, um, where we had two very, very powerful players. Um, one was um, the Centers for Disease Control in Bill Reeves, who was a, an epidemiologist, um, someone I knew very well, um, and um, who basically um, kept publishing research that I think ultimately ended up victimizing patients for 20 years. And the problem with getting him removed from the CDC um, because he was causing, I think, a considerable amount of harm to the patient community um, was that he was a whistleblower. And his father was actually pretty famous as well. So, um, and the whistleblowing that he did was um, occurred in the 1990s where um, money was allocated by Congress to CFS research. It got diverted to other areas. I think he was involved in diverting it but he basically accused his boss. So he became a whistleblower, and then he was protected 
And we kept saying, what do we do with this guy um, who basically kept coming out with research um, that basically said, we don't find anything. We don't find anything. I, I remember one time with um, Bill Reeves, um, you know, sitting at a table with him at, over lunch, and he had just broken his, his, his um, leg. And he sort of said, you see, Len, my broken leg, I'm working through the pain. I'm pushing myself, and I'm, that's what the patient's got to do. They just got to learn to sort of push through it. And I said, Bill, patients haven't broken their leg. This is not a leg injury, <laughs> this illness. Um, so you can get an idea of who he was. Um, we also had the largest patient organization that was um, led by Kim McCleary, um, who was the CFIDS Association head. Um, and she was in collusion with the Centers for Disease Control, getting millions of dollars to brand the term CFS while she was on that name change work group that I talked about in 2000. So here she is, a representative of the large patient organization who's basically getting money, millions of dollars, from Bill Reeves and the CDC to brand CFS when she's basically telling people that, um, you know, we're going to change the name, which she had no interest in doing. So the large patient organization was misguided. The research organization was misguided, which is very powerful, the CDC. And what do you do? Where do you start? I looked at the research in the early 1990s, and I said, the name's terrible. The prevalence rates are off. The treatments they're using are victimizing. And they're never going to find biological markers with this case definition, which is inappropriate. Faced with those types of hurdles, I decided to spend 10 years just working on basic epidemiology because I decided that unless we figure out how many people have this illness, it'll never be taken seriously. So I put a research team together, many different disciplines, um, to work on this. And it took that time of early 1990s to the end of the 90s to get this research out. By putting that research out and working on the name change issue, I got appointed to not only the scientific organization, um, but also the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. So I was then in a position to basically have some influence. Long story short, Bill Reeves ultimately, by doing a number of things, alienated the patients, alienate, alienated the scientific community, and even alienated some people in Washington. And eventually, um, five years ago, um, he was removed. Um, so that was a fresh air. Um, the person who was in charge of the patient organization, after running it for over 20 years, eventually left because the patients were so upset which what, what she was doing. So I guess the lesson for me is, A, sometimes you've got to have a 20-year time commitment to sort of see changes. Number two, you've got to have something that keeps encouraging you to sort of keep going when it looks so bad. And I'm not going to talk about politics now. <laughs> but sometimes small wins help nourish us to basically are able to sort of sustain us in this effort at bringing about policy change. So the types of research that I talked about, I consider small wins because they were gratifying, they were helpful, but they kept me going. And the third thing just to mention is that when we work for change, we can't just work as individuals. We have to work with organizations that have clout. And that has emerged over the last couple of years. And I might add that there's going to be a TED Talk by Jen Bria, um, and, and she's at Sundance right now with a film that's going to be a major change in this particular community. Based on your experience, what do you believe are the causes of MECFS? So 
Um, good question, and, and I didn't really get into um, etiology, um, but um, I think that there are some people who are genetically predisposed um, toward having this illness, um, just as some people are genetically predisposed to having a number of chronic conditions. Um, I think that those people who are genetically predisposed have something like a predisposition, um, and I think that it probably has something to do with um, probably pro-inflammatory versus, um, you know, immune cells, but um, whatever. I think that there's something there that there's some evidence for. Then there's some precipitant that occurs. Um, it could be an accident. Um, it could be, um, you know, getting mono, um, you know, which is the Epstein-Barr virus that um, a certain number of people do not recover from. And I might add that we have a prospective longitudinal study going on at Northwestern right now where we're following over 3,000 students who have come into the university and we're watching those who develop mono and we're watching them over time. And we have over 120 individuals who have developed mono and we're following which ones are staying sick and which ones aren't to basically be able to look at what happened when they were healthy to, to find predictors, okay? Um, so some precipitant occurs. It could be a virus. It could be, um, um, it could be a number of things. Um, and then I think ultimately we're talking about um, a brain encephalomyelitis. Um, there's basically an inflammation in the brain. Um, and that brain basically um, probably has dysregulation throughout it. Our research now at DePaul is focusing on quantitative EEG, where we have um, several people who are um, very adept at doing this type of uh, work. And what we find in the brain um, is that, um, um, and, and we think this is something that's common in encephalitis, um, um, a brain disorder, um, that um, when you are sleeping, um, you are in delta mode in the brain. But when you are during um, waking hours, you should be in something else called alpha. Um, we find that patients, um, and we have, um, by the way, if there's any patients here that want to have their kind of brains uh, looked at, um, just let me know. We have <laughs> ongoing studies going. Um, and if there's healthy people out here that would like to have their brains looked at, we have brains that we'd like to take a look at as well. So you just let me know. We, we don't charge for this work. Um, but it's, it's basic research. But it's interesting. The patients are in delta, which it should be occurring at sleep during the day. So again, there's an explanation for the cognitive impairment. They're sleeping. Um, and, and that's part of what's contributing to some of the cognitive impairment. So yes, we, we ultimately think that there will be biological explanations for, for many of the things that the patients who are called unexplained illnesses, who people don't believe. And that's why it's so important to diagnose the patients correctly, to bring the right people into the lab and to do these types of tests with the appropriate kids. I might add our Northwestern study, we have, we have blood vials on the entire group. So we'll be able to look at the blood to see if there's any differences um, in those individuals, not just at baseline, but throughout the entire study. Um, we also have a study going on that some of you might have been called on. Um, we've already called a couple of hundred thousand people in the Chicago area um, doing a basic epidemiology study of pediatric ME and CFS. So if any of you get a phone call from us, it's, it's from our group, and we are interviewing the parents. Parents, if they have a kid that's sick, we bring them to Lurie Children's Hospital and we give them a complete medical and psychiatric evaluation. So we're doing the same research that we did on adults in the 1990s. We're now doing that on kids um, right now. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit uh, went, went on with that, but, but as you can see, it's, it's a very complicated um, question. And certainly, um, if you're a virologist, you think it's a virus. 
If you're a immunologist, you think it's the immune system that's aberrant and that's um, like, you know, which, you know, certainly there's immune factors. If you're a neuroendocrinologist, you think it's um, some type of neuroendocrine cortisol malfunction. And if you think it's cerebrally essentially mediated, um, then you look to the brain. Um, so you have people that are looking at all these different areas. Um, I personally think that we're talking about a brain encephalopathy. Uh, related to that, I'm interested to know, do you suspect any kind of environmental exposures could possibly be interacting with a predisposition? So, uh, and, um, and, and also, do you suspect that there could be uh, an industry or some group that may have some research on this and may be not wanting to expose that research? Um, an industry that might not want to expose that research. Are you talking about the U.S. economy? Just joking. Uh, um, so so um, we dump literally thousands of new untested chemical products into the market every year. Um, the consequences of these products, we don't know. Um, but certainly um, it should be um, concerning for us all. The area that's probably been the most worked on is with mold. Um, and there, there is, um, as some of you know, actually in the Edmonton Skokie area, some very prominent people, um, we have several in the audience, matter of fact, um, who have very specialties in this area. But yes, um, there are people who seem to have these symptoms elicited um, when they are exposed to mold. And as you know, mold can be in buildings without people being aware of it. Um, and it's interesting that those individuals that have mold exposure and have this whole symptom complex, um, often when they get out of these sick environments, um, most of their symptoms go away. Um, and uh, so it's, it's and, and actually some individuals have to end up going to desert areas um, and stay there for a while until they clean their system. Um, and when they do that, they have to get rid of everything that has mold on it um, so that they can have a fresh start. And yes, um, um, I, I am in contact with a number of those people and we actually did a, um, a treatment study with um, a couple patients um, which we published this last year where we kind of actually showed kind of when, when you reduce ex exposure um, to people that have this mold issue, um, symptomatology decreases. Uh, uh, two questions I have. Uh, one is mortality compared to other similar psychiatric conditions like depression, other things. Is there a correlation or this is uh, not increased in mortality? Number two, some of the answers you alluded to, the question I want to ask, but uh, not quite detailed. So uh, the fMRI, functional MRIs, and the sleep studies, is there anything coming out of the initial analysis of the data on those things? So um, Ben Nadelson, who is um, in New York City, um, has done some uh, really good research with um, sleep studies. Um, and, um, and, and there's a, most work in the brain has been with fMRI. Um, the reason that I'm not a, as big a fan of fMRI as I am with uh, QEG, quantitative EEG, um, is that um, the quantitative EEG gets to the millisecond. And what's going on in the brain is at the millisecond level. And what's happening, we're finding, is that the brain is not communicating as a system with itself in an efficient way. And you don't get it by looking at one or two seconds, which is the fMRI research, where the blood goes to an area that's being kind of more exercised or used. The types of dysfunction are occurring at the thousands of, it's like it's, at, it's the transmission of the neurons. That's what you've got to be looking at. And that's what quantitative EEG does. And I might add that quantitative EEG is not EEG. EEG, you look at this EEG, you can't interpret it, except if you have someone maybe with epilepsy. It's very difficult. You've got to have a program 
that can take this data and put it into a way of analyzing it. And that's what quantitative EEG does. Um, and it's, it's, it's very different from what happens often um, for neurologists who are using EEG, which unfortunately the reliability of two people looking at EEG is about 0.2, which means there's no reliability. Um, in terms of mortality and death, um, I have been the person who has done probably more research in that area than, than um, just about anybody else. Um, and I started this about 10 years ago um, where, um, you know, what people basically said was, well, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, people don't die of it, you know, it's basically, you know, it's not that serious. And I said, you know, I, I knew people that were dying of, of this. So I said, you know, we've got to um, figure this out. So um, I looked at a list that was um, put together by people that had died, over 150, um, a memorial list for one of the patient organizations. And we looked at the age in which they died. So everyone dies of something. And, and again, HIV doesn't kill you. It's the opportunistic infections after that that end up doing that. So, so what we did was we looked at people dying and categorized them into three primary areas, and then we looked at the age of death. That was the interesting piece. So the three things people died of, one was suicide because lack of hope. Um, you know, if you have an illness that's stigmatizing, that's severe, and everyone's questioning the legitimacy of it, and you can no longer work, and you lose your friends, and you basically kind of begin to doubt yourself, might get depressed. I mean, suicide is a risk um, and needs to be dealt with. The other two things that people died of was one was heart disease, one was cancer. Okay, so you say, well, heart disease, cancer, I mean, that kills probably the majority of people anyway. But what we found was the people who died of these illnesses were dying 10 to 15 years earlier than the national norms would suggest. That suggests that there's something probably in the immune system. I mean, we all basically have cancer cells. The problem is they're being knocked out by an immune system that's working. But if your immune system is not working, you're more likely to basically, we think, develop cancer, which is what we think is possible. And in terms of heart disease, you know, people who have this illness um, often have um, issues with cardiac problems. I don't, I'm not sure if you know um, what orthostatic intolerance is, and that's when you stand up and you feel a little bit dizzy um, or you can't keep your balance. That's because, you know, the blood is not staying up to the brain. Um, it's, um, it has to get pumped up there, and if it doesn't, you get um, symptoms. Um, so there could be circulatory issues that could ultimately impact the heart. Um, so we published that about 10 years ago. That got a lot of press. Um, but recently, within the last um, month and a half, um, we did a study that was, again, initiated by a patient who said, my kid died. Um, I want you to do autopsies of these kids. Um, and this particular patient who is in New Jersey worked with us for the last three years. Um, and we had um, 56 individuals who died of this illness. Um, and we have done psychological autopsies of them and looked at the reason for death. Um, and we have um, just published that paper, um, if you're interested. And again, um, what we found was um, results that were comparable. All right, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Thank you.